Okay, good morning, Bayside. Welcome this morning. Happy Sunday. Are you ready to worship this morning? We have a full slate of worship songs and an awesome message for you this morning, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Thank you from home. If you're joining us from home, we're so glad you're with us. We can't wait for the day when all this goes away and we can all just be one big happy family here in the building. And yeah, that'll be awesome. Just keep praying for that for your church. We have a couple things coming up we just want to uh, remind you of. We were going to have a baptism this morning, but due to circumstances beyond our control, it's been postponed till next week. So if you know anybody or if you would like to be baptized, please get a hold of us through info at bayside.com. And uh, we will get back to you and give you all the information that you need to join in on that. It's an amazing time to uh, just see people dedicate their lives to Christ and, a, and an outward testimony of their faith. We are also having an awesome small group session. If you haven't been able to join us, we would really like to invite you. Last week, we explored such minor topics as why are we here? What is our purpose in life? You know, nothing real important. This week, we've got even better sessions going on. It's off of Right Now Media. It's with Louis Giglio, who's an amazing, amazing, um, just being able to, to articulate the gospel. And we are really enjoying being with him and having the group discussion around that. Also, it's not too soon. Just be thinking and praying about Easter. It's not that far away. It's only four or five weeks, probably the most important holiday season that we uh, celebrate as a church, as Christians. This We serve a risen Savior. So be praying about that. Be praying about who you can invite, whether on Zoom or to come here personally and uh, to join us on that Easter. And especially with the circumstances we've been under and not being able to meet, there may be people out there who might join you in a Zoom session if you're at home who might never, ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ again. So be thinking and praying about that. With that, are you ready to worship? Let's get on our feet and let's stand up and worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Good morning, Bayside. Let's sing together. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible through you. Thy eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I live in by faith. Nothing is impossible. 
Father, we come to you this morning so perfectly imperfect, built under your creation, so deeply flawed, so deeply human. But God, you've given us the tools every day. You've given us the tools every day to be better, to be closer to you, God to embrace your love, to embrace your mercy. That's why, God, every day is a gift. That's how good you are. We come to the altar this morning, God. We lay our burdens down. We lay them down here in this place, your house, God. And as we transition into service, God, I just pray that those who do not have the strength to lay down their fears at the altar, God, that you watch over them, that you love them, and you give them the strength to do so. And God, maybe there's some people who haven't been here in a while who know who you are, and maybe they need to reacquaint themselves with you, God. I pray that the words that are spoken this morning transcend, God, that they, that they transcend understanding. And that these words, God, they just wash all of us in your love. We say all this in your precious name. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. ministry that is ready to receive these awesome kids and tell them about Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and stay here if you want to give them some light. Is this on? Test, test. It is on. Okay. All right. Well, my name is Lucindo. As most of you know, one of the pastors around here. And this morning, we are going to continue in our series, uh, Colossians, that we actually are just not even halfway through. Thank you, just in case. Awesome. And um, a as Tim mentioned this morning, in case you got here a little bit after his uh, welcome, we had a baptism ready to go this morning, but it's going to be postponed. It needed some circumstances arose just uh, last night that uh, the person who was going to get baptized it needs to pro postpone it. So that gives you and I an option, an opportunity to invite more people into the uh the opportunity to get baptized. If you haven't been baptized already yourself, or if you know somebody needs to get baptized, bring them here and then uh, dunk them. No, uh, it's actually a, a something that you choose to do. But you know what? Since we have this baptismal here in front of us right now, I, I'm just going to invite you to just let it be a reminder of when you got baptized. If you've been baptized before, let it be a reminder. Uh, uh, remember, in fact, for me, when I, I've, gone, I've gone through these... Um, these exercises, these ways to, to connect with God deals where we remember our baptism by, by get, dipping our hands in a bowl of water or looking at a baptismal, whatever it is. And I, I, for me, when I reflect back on my baptism, when I reflect back and I understand what God did, what led up to it, what he's done since then, it's even, it's, it's to some degree more powerful, more meaningful. When you look back at when you got baptized now, you remember what God is continually doing. He's continually washing us clean. He's continually doing a work in us. And so just remember, that if this catches your eye, let it be a reminder of when you were baptized, when you made that decision to let God wash you clean and give you a new life. All right, so we are starting our, uh, continuing with verses, chapter 1, 24 verse 24 through chapter 2 verse number 8 it's kind of a long passage there's so much there there's no way i can get to it all that's why i'm really thankful we have a midweek bible study that's uh, going along the same passage and if you don't have that link that zoom link it's going out through facebook emails and texts but if you don't have that link and you want to join the midweek bible study to get more in-depth understanding and discussion just email info at bayside and dot bayside and all right. 
First, I want to review just a little bit just to catch us up. In Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 21 through 23, it's a kind of a transition passage going into what we're studying next. This is what we read. And you, who once were alienated, actually, before we even read the word of God, will you pray with me right now? Father God, we come before you right now. I come before you right now, acknowledging that we're dependent on you, Holy Spirit, to understand your word. But we know that through your power, through your spirit, you can translate these words, your letter to us, into our lives and apply and bring us to application and depths of understanding. I pray, Lord God, that you would take this message, make it yours, make everybody hear from you directly and not from me. We turn our attention to you and our focus on you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now let's read. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you can continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a servant. The ESV also says, which I, Paul, became a minister. And it's interesting, so we, we talked about, last week we talked about the supremacy of Christ, how Jesus is enough for everything. He is enough to make us enough. That whenever, whenever we feel like I'm not enough, I shouldn't make it the decision, I'm not, I haven't had enough training, experiences, I'm not the one that people should ask about God, please just take, accept my invite to church, but don't even ask me about it. Whenever we think that, we need to be confronted with the reality, the truth, that Jesus inside of us is enough, and that Jesus has reconciled us to God. He is the one who has done so, and because he has done so, he is also the one who continues to work out his life, his truth in us. So we are always enough because it's no longer about us anymore. It's about Jesus. It's about what he has done and what he can do. And then we, from, from that, we go into Paul talking about, <laughs> it almost seems like a slap in the face at, at first, but it, it's just a reality that we need to understand. He says that we were once alienated from God. We were once in our minds even enemies. The NIV says that we are enemies uh, toward God in our minds because everything that we think about outside of a relationship with Jesus, everything we think about is about us and not about him. And that trajectory of focusing on us rather than on God is a trajectory that continues to receive and produce new thoughts and ideas that are in opposition to God. And, and so whenever we drift from our, our focus or we drift from our relationship with Jesus, we tend to receive and accept thoughts and ideas that would place importance on what we want more than importance on what uh, God wants. So he says, though we were enemies, and in other scriptures we say, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Though we were enemies, Jesus still decided to put himself in harm's way and to die for us. And so when our focus is on him and our uh, faith is in him, we know that what he has done is so much greater than anything that we can do. And we can continue to live in this confidence, continue to live in this reality if we stand firm in faith, continue to live this life out. Easier said than done. Every single time we wake up in the morning, there is a world philosophy, the devil's plans, and our own desires that are still competing against God, desires for God that come up with us, that wake up with us, that would steer us away from remaining in him. But so it takes a little bit of effort. I put on your uh, handout there a chart to, to help through this, to help us understand what it might mean to continue in faith, establish firm, not move from the hope. So gospel living related to this passage, gospel living, just looking at verse 23, continuing in faith. Let's just look at that. Continuing in faith. That's trusting in Jesus. Continuing in faith is trusted in Jesus. Now, that seems like it's easy enough to accept and to agree with. But if you really think about it, when you and I really think about that and study that, we realize that trusting in Jesus 
continuing in faith takes effort. Now, the, the Spirit of God is in us. The mind of Christ is in us already, so the effort to turn to him is powerful. But it takes effort to trust in Jesus. Just think about the things that are going on in your life, in my life right now, when I look back uh, on a week. How much was I trusting him, and how much was I thinking about him while trying to trust in what I could do? It, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. Now, the world philosophy and religion that we would run into today and throughout time would say to continue in self-effort, even if that self-effort is religious. Continue to come to a church to light a candle, to do some kind of religious activity, to make yourself right with God, to then be able to believe that, his, that you earn favor and almost like karma, right? I mean, you know, a lot of the Christian world actually has accepted the idea of karma without even calling it karma. If I do some good today, it's going to result in God doing something good for me later. That is actually not biblical. That's karma. What the Bible says is what you plant, the seed that you plant is what will grow. So uh, established and firm. Esta we get established and firm, but we realize it's Jesus' righteousness, his life imputed to us. That It's no longer anything that we can do for ourselves. It is just a gift of God. It's, it's actually a gift to be in right standing with God. And we are established and firm when we wake up every morning, go to sleep every night, knowing that what we did does not matter as much as what Jesus has already done. We could go to sleep every single night knowing, I am enough. Not because of what I did today, but because of who I trusted today. I am enough. Every single day that you go through, is go you're going to be met with some message or some experience, one way or another, that's going to challenge that, that position that you have with God of being enough. Not moved from the hope. Oh, uh, and moving on to world religion, and philosophy, instead of being established and firm, we have this conditional value as long as we're doing enough or as long as we're being enough, as long as we're praying enough. And not moved from hope is this new life of grace living, living by God's grace. World ideas, philosophies, religions is always earned favor with God. In fact, if you look at all the old uh, religions, it starts off with God's posture of folded arms saying, man, you've messed up. What are you going to do to appease me? Whether it's mythology or whether it's one of the major religions. But Jesus makes it so that we understand that our trust in him, our focus on him, gives us right standing with him always, forever. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel, that it's a free gift to have relationship with God. And relationship with God is movement and power and joy and love in this world. And Paul writes, this is the gospel I proclaimed in all, and it's been proclaimed to all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Now, Paul says, I've become a minister, a servant of this gospel, meaning all of my life now resolves around how can I communicate to you that you have a relationship waiting for you with God. Now, but before Paul became a, a, a servant or a minister of this gospel, Jesus became its servant. Jesus left heaven to connect with us, to demonstrate for us God's love, to be God's actual heart for us, his actual message, the logos of God. He became that, and Jesus left the throne of heaven to be a servant to us, to serve us. His posture toward us, Jesus' posture toward us is to give and to serve, to do whatever is needed to wash out, to cleanse out of our lives everything that hurts us and troubles us and bothers us and ultimately comes between us and a relationship with God. You see, when we have a relationship with God, one that is not affected or tainted, imagine the mountain high, high, mountaintop experiences you may have had here and there where you just, your conscience is clear, it's free, you're good, and you have connection to his love. In that moment and in, that, in those seasons, we can do anything. Our relationships become better. Our outlook on our life is filled with possibility. We don't become reserved, complaining, and, and, and looking at everybody as the problem. In fact, there is no problem in those moments, but it, it takes a, the effort to continue to focus on him. And Paul says the effort on his life 
amounts to it, him becoming a servant for the gospel, it becoming his purpose. Now, that's what Paul does for us. But as we read the Bible, if we understand uh, how to study it, we read that that's written for us as well to understand our life now, that we would become servants of the gospel. We are servants of the gospel as a calling with Jesus as our master. Let's try to break that down just a little bit. Called as servants. One, we are servants of Christ. Two, servants of the gospel. Three, servants of the church. Now you think about everything that we have going on in our lives, all that we are, all of our talents, passions, personality, everything, Walking with Christ, trusting in him, it means that everything that we are, all that we are, relates to, translates to being used for a, a service to Jesus, which is communicating the gospel one way or another to those around us or to specific in specific ways, and as servants of the church, which means that the people around us, fellow, fellow believers, are the objects of God's love, primarily. That w the people around us a, a, in, in church, in our church family, are the people that God wants you to exercise his grace to. He wants us to do that to the whole world. But we're joined together as a church family to connect in such a way where the people that we connect with and we look at in our deepest, darkest, hardest disagreements, we still say, God's grace trumps everything else. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to build you up. There's something about me that will build you up. There's something about you that will be build uh, me up. And that takes a lot of effort to accept, I think, because church is not perfect, but Jesus is. So the message of the gospel is primary, and we carry and spread that message of the gospel. Now that right there already, I, it confronts me and it challenges me, because this is what has seeped into church for the longest time. It's just Jesus is awesome, he's wonderful, and I have all these wonderful plans, and he is for me. He wants me to have the abundant life, and he loves me, so I'm going to come to him and ask him to give me strength and power, like Scripture says, for the things that I want. And, and here we have kind of a reversal, a full reversal of that, is that we would make him all that we want and, and trust that what he wants for us is what's best for us. Here's a reflection question. How does my life communicate to the world and reinforce the message to other believers an invitation to a relationship with God without conditions? Long sentence. Let me see if I can say that a little bit better. How does my life in any way tell anybody else that there's an invitation to a relationship with God, an invitation that doesn't have conditions? How does my life do that? Let me break that down a little bit. How does my gifting, my skills, my personality experiences the, the, where I work, my family, my birth order, what I think is funny, what, what's fun to me or not fun to me. How can God use all of that, a variety of that, to communicate to others that God wants to have a relationship with them and it's without condition? This is one thing we might think about. I mean, that's a reflection question for you, between you and God, or maybe between you and your spouse. They probably have that answer ready for you already. Um, but one of the things we might think about is just in our reactions to, to everyone. I, I hope you've had the opportunity, or you will one day, you will one day have a, a, a time where somebody asks you, why don't you react like everybody else? Why aren't you as angry as everybody else? Why aren't you as troubled as everybody else? Or why, when I did you wrong, why did you forgive me? Or all these different ways that we interact with the world with God's grace and his love, positioned secure with him so that we don't need the affirmation and approval of anybody else first. We go out into this world, give his grace, and people wonder what is different about us. Easier said than done, but the effort that goes into doing that, to live in a life of gospel living, the effort that goes into that looks a lot like doing it wrong, <laughs> losing faith sometimes, or realizing I'm not trusting you. And th in that realization, we also realize, oh, God's so good. He's so gracious. And now I'm learning. The effort that goes into living this gospel-centered life looks a lot like mistakes and hiccups, which equates, when in touch with God's grace, equates to learning. 
learning of what that means. And when we learn, we get stronger. Now, as we go into reading uh, the next passage ahead, this next passage ahead, I want us to remember that the word of God, that Jesus spoke about the word of God being like a seed that's planted. And when it's received on noble soil, meaning it's, it's soil that's ready for it to grow into a, a soil where it could be watered and uh, where roots could go down deep. When it's received in that way, it will grow and multiply up to 100 times. What God, what we're talking about right now, about the gospel life coming out of us and producing something in somebody else's life, requires the word of God to come into us and to grow in us. That the word of God, the truth of God, the, the gospel of God would grow in us and outgrow anything else that is not from God. When Jesus said that parable, he said that seed was scattered uh, from a farmer and some fell on hard ground on a, uh, on a path where the word was received with joy, but it had no place to go. It, had, it was hard ground, couldn't establish root and continue growing. Other seed fell on among thorns, so it started to grow, but it was choked out by the thorns and the weeds. And then he said that other seed fell on good soil, where the seed went down, it established root, it sprouted and started growing uh, rapidly and, it, and multiplying. And, and so when we receive God's word, we need to understand, are we, re are we believing what we're reading? Or are we worried? Are we receiving it with worry and stress? Are we receiving it just in experience? Or are we believing it? All right, so let me read through pa the, the passage here. It's kind of a long passage, verses 24 through chapter 2, verse 8. Here we go. Now, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I got to pause right there just to share a little bit about that. <clears throat> we read this from the first epistle of uh, Peter, too, that that prophets and angels longed to look into what God was doing and this mystery that was being put out there, and it wasn't revealed. It, it was only revealed after Jesus was resurrected and that Jesus was actually, uh, he actually came into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, the mystery of Christ in us is the biggest deal ever. It's the biggest deal that Christ would be living in us when we are able to understand and live that out and, and live a life where we understand God Almighty is actually inside of us, that we actually have his, his heart and his mind when all the other stuff is sifted away, we realize what incredible joy, power, understanding, ability we have for this life and for eternity. And in this world and the ideas of this world, we're always thinking about what's out there that could help my life. And in the gospel, we have the reality that in a mystery revealed that God himself would come inside of us and be in us and move in us. So moving on. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom and we may, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen, my face, me, seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the richness, richness, riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you or deceive you, with plausible arguments. Other translations say fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing uh, to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. 
Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, this is our verse of the year, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the, the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. You see in that passage, well, there's a lot there. But there's something for us to understand there, and it has to do with encouragement and unity. There's so much theology there, and I think we're going to have to get to that during the midweek, uh, during uh, midweek Bible study. No pressure, Tim. Can, can you just make that all make sense uh, this Thursday? Yeah, no, no pressure. Can you just <laughs> break it all down? But what we see there is that Paul is saying, I'm struggling for you, and I'm even suffering for you. Paul was being put in prison. He was beaten down left and right for promoting the gospel and talking about Jesus as the, the risen Lord and the one who evens the field uh, on everybody and, and makes it so that everybody can come to God. That wasn't an idea that uh, anybody in power wanted a, a, at all because the, the day that he was writing to and living in, there was clear, distinct, and powerful set in place social statuses with everybody. And that w those social statuses were reinforced uh, politically and religiously. And here, so that if you were a servant or a slave, you pretty much would always be that. If you were in, in power and your family was in power, you pretty much always be that. Everybody kind of had their place to go. But Paul, what he was preaching was this gospel that says that there is no difference between you and I. Male or female, we are all one in Christ, and we can all come to God because of what Jesus did. And that really destroyed a lot of the statuses that, and the powers that were in place. So he was suffering. He was getting beaten left and right. But while he was getting beaten and put in prison, churches were sprouting up. And those churches that were sprouting up, like uh, at Colossae, they were sprouting up, and they, they, they were discovering this new connection and this love with one another, this love that they'd never felt before because it was a love driven by the Holy Spirit, that they would look at each other and go, I love you, and you love me, and, and God is awesome. And that's something that they never experienced before. And Paul was suffering for that. He said, I'll take all the attention, I'll take all the abuse, but it, and it's for you. But this is why I, I am willing to struggle for you. This is why so that you will understand this mystery, which is Christ in you, so that you will fully understand the mystery of God, the knowledge of God. Paul is saying it was, it's worth it for me to be whipped left and right, thrown in prison, spit on, abused, beat up left and right, if, if, if that results in me communicating to you guys that you could understand God at a whole different level. And that was, that had to, there were barriers to that. The, the Colossians were, were getting messages and philosophies and religions and Judaizers coming into the church saying, no, you have to earn your way to God. That's the way it's always been. It's not all about Jesus. Jesus is great, just like we hear it in this world right now. Jesus is great, a great teacher, but he's not everything. And what we're reading here in Colossians is shouting a confrontation to all those ideas saying, no, Jesus is absolutely everything. There is nothing left over after Jesus. He fills everything, and he lives in us. So if Jesus lives in us, who is supreme over everything, rules everything, and holds the whole universe together, then there is no sin, there is no idea, no philosophy, there is nobody else's experience or your experience that could take away what he has said about us and what he has done for us, which is reconciled us completely by God's grace with him. That's immovable. It can't change. So we can walk in this world with the fullness of Christ. But there's some stuff to get through in our lives, in our world, in our psychology to get to that full understanding. He says that we must be united and encouraged. We need mutual encouragement and unity. How do we get unity with one another when we disagree so much? In this world, there's so much disagreement, and it creeps into the church. There's so much disagreement. How do we get unity when we can't even agree on how we want the music to be? I'm thankful that in this church, none of that small detail stuff matters that much. I'm glad that people have been so gracious and so generous 
and, and our growth process and that that what we have here i think for the most part is people just loving each other and experiencing god's love with one another but when we come together here's here's purpose this is the purpose of our lives this isn't small purpose capital p purpose when we come together gather whether in this building outside or anywhere else we have a job we have a job we have a role in each other's lives and that is to encourage one another mutual encouragement wherever you go yeah, I understand this. For now on, you, you understand this purpose. You have a, a, the role of encouraging somebody and letting that other person encourage you. It might just be through friendship. It might be a word, but it's rooted in this truth that God is for us and he loves us, and that's immovable, that we have grace. And, oh, my gosh, there's people in this church that just exude that grace that whenever you talk to them, you go, ah, oh, I feel better about myself. I'm okay. But that there's also unity. That we don't let the small details, the, the little things that we disagree about become divisive and even split us. What we have unity about is that Jesus is the way. And we have unity about this too. That because God loves us so much, the truth is that each one of us is lovable. <laughs> that because God loves us and has gifted us and has purpose for us, each one of us has a reason to be in your life and in my life. We can be encouraged and unified. When we come together and we gather together and we're encouraged and unified that way, we're on the pathway to gaining, to gaining knowledge and understanding about God. As I laid it out there, we read, that they may be encouraged and find unity in love. Unity in love. Not unity in politics. Not unity in ideas. Not unity in the way we think the world should be exactly right now, but unity and love. We just love each other. I, 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 that, that means that we could argue and disagree, but we'll always say, man, I love you. I, I love that we have a, in my experience with our pastoral staff and our leaders, we could, we could chew on stuff together and, and go back and forth, but at the end of the day, I, I look around and think, oh, they're some of my favorite people ever. I just love them. And let's look at each other that way too. No matter what our disagreements are, no matter what our misunderstandings are, at the end of the day, in Christ, we, we let his heart beat inside of us that is in us say, yes, some of my favorite people ever. I love them. I can't wait till they understand that I'm right. <laughs> How much greater the unity will be. <laughs> if only they knew how much I knew. I can't think of anything I don't know. So that they may be encouraged and find unity and love so that they might have complete understanding so that they might know Christ fully. And that's the ultimate goal there, to know Jesus. Not just to know how he could bless you, but to know him, to just know him. That's the wonderful mountaintop experience that uh, Peter and, and James, Peter and John, that is, were invited to that they didn't understand it when Jesus was on the mountaintop and he's talking to Isaiah and, and Moses, and they're just blown away. But there's this place to, to understand that Jesus is greater than everything. He is incredible. I believe, I know this, I believe this on my heart, that when we see Jesus face to face, our knees are just going to buckle. We're going to crumble, and we're going to be amazed at his glory. And yet he's going to lift us up by his hands, and we're going to be amazed at his love. He is all-powerful and all sufficient in his love for us. To know him is our ultimate goal. The pathway of knowing Jesus is unity and encouragement with one another to understand a little bit more. That's why Bible studies and small groups and just circling up with each other organically is so important, that we would discuss Jesus with one another. They would try to find application with one another. I love meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. It's my, one of the most satisfying things I, I get to do and just talk about their life when they get to hear about my life, and then we talk about where Jesus fits into it, and I know he's right there among us. It's one of the most satisfying things to do when we talk like that, and the outcome of that is, well, let's, maybe he wants us to do this. Oh, that's so awesome. And you know what is also awesome? When we get to those points where we're having conversations with, with people, and it even is a struggle, but we choose God's grace instead. We churn and we let it trouble us, but we choose God's grace instead. And then coming out of that, we might even have a, a, a moment where we realize, oh God, you want me to do something different that I've never done in my life. 
talk to somebody I've never talked to, start an endeavor, uh, of whether it be a business or a ministry or anything that I've never done in my life, and I don't want to. I'm scared and I'm nervous. I think this is you talking to me, but I rather, I wish I didn't hear it. This is difficult, but the struggle, and even the struggle of realizing that you've had that call and you've rejected it many times, but being in touch with God's grace, you realize that all that process is churning and working inside of us to finally release the thing inside of us that has been in the way, and it comes before us, and you realize, oh, I've made so many things more important than you, God. Forgive me. I repent of that. I cast those idols aside, and then boom, you take a step forward, and I'll do what you ask me to do. I'm going to live my life differently. I'm going to start something I've never done. I'm going to have conversations I've never had done before. The other side of that struggle where you finally do what he asks you to do and move and trust and obedience is joy and understanding of who God is that much more. If we keep on trying to live our lives with the routine of church, with the routine and rhythms of faith that we try to establish for ourselves only, then our understanding of him will be limited. So word of, word of Christ in us, that's trust and faith. Applying knowledge of God to life is obedience. Connection to the body of Christ, as we've, as we've been reading, that produces purpose and community. And our final point, which is the key point, talking about keys to living a gospel-centered life, a confident life, this is critical. All the messages has been pointing to this here, to trust and obey, to just trust and obey. Is that some of the hardest things that we could do? Is to just trust and obey. So the best experiences we'll have in our life, the ones that strengthen us, the ones that produce healthy relationships in our life, the ones that steer us in the direction that we realize we are always meant to go. Those experiences come after trust. And we're, we stand firm in faith when we hold on to trust. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. It's repeating Colossians 2, 4 through 8. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. In the weeks to come, I'm going to be talking about the different ideas and the different philosophies that are in our world today. There's so many different ideas and philosophies that creep into everyday life and even into the church. Things like modernism, postmodernism, humanism, all these different isms, but also different ideas about what faith really is and who Jesus really is. There's this church, I, I've been reading more and more about this going into the message here, and there's more and more churches that are popping up questioning whether the Bible is actually inerrant the Word of God. And I'm still old school enough to tell you that the Bible is absolutely the Word of God and inerrant and all that we need for life. And what I get upset about and get fired up about as your shepherd, as a pastor along with you, is there's our ideas sleeping, seeping into the church more and more that would say, aside, those ideas and those thoughts are ahead of us more and more. And I'm preaching this message to equip you, for you to be equipped, for you to understand that what we need in 2021, for next week, for the week ahead of us, and definitely in the years to come, is a solid understanding of God's word and firmness in our relationship and our trust and obedience in Jesus Christ. It is actually what we need. It's not just an enhancement for life, but it's what we need. Outside of that, there's all kinds of philosophies and ideas and ways of the world that are going to be speaking more powerfully and with more consequence for not following them. But we won't, but we won't, listen, we won't, we won't be deceived when we have the word of God in us, planted in noble soil, like Jesus' parable, 
meaning that we're not going to let the stress of the world and our fear guide our decisions. We're going to let trust in Jesus and our study of him and interacting with the world, with each other here and outside of here with one another out of trust in Jesus by God's grace, gospel living. What does it mean to be rooted? One idea that I'll throw out is reaching as deep and wide into the word of God, connection to the body of Christ, as we've been talking about, and making your life about the gospel. That's what it means to be rooted in Christ. Just like Paul was saying, I'm a, I've become a servant of the gospel. When you look at roots, and we'll be looking at this in the weeks to come, th they go deep or they go wide or they do both. The deeper they go and the wider they go, the larger and the bigger the, the plant will be. You can plant a, a, a plant, uh, and if it doesn't have roots, it's not going to actually produce fruit, all right? And if it doesn't have water, it won't produce fruit. But when you establish roots down deep, it is constant. those roots are constantly looking for a source of water to deliver that water to the fruit. It goes through the trunk, to the branch, to the leaf, and to where that fruit will be. It's ultimately trying to produce fruit. What comes out of us is the fruit of God's heart himself. So what that looks like is reaching down deep, getting God's word inside of us, connecting to the body of Christ, and making our life about the gospel, which means as long as it depends on me, people are going to know that there's grace in this world. As long as it depends on me, people are going to know that they don't have to please me or appease me or live up to my standards. Now, even if you're a supervisor at work, there's a way to manage that. There are reasons why somebody <laughs> might need to get fired. But you can do that in a gracious way that doesn't attack, attack the character or the values. Another point to end on, an idea that is in disagreement with Jesus as the one who reconciled us to God completely can grow like a seed planted. An idea that is in disagreement with Jesus as the one who reconciled us to God completely can grow like a seed that was planted. So watch for that. Finally, we have learned enough to trust and obey. We have learned enough to trust and obey. I think even if you're a new believer, the fact that you are a new believer means that you've learned enough to trust and obey. But in this life, over and over and over, we, we come to experiences and moments where we're like, God, is this really you? God, is this what you want me to do? Can I still give? Should I still tithe? Should I still give to that, this cause? Should I still participate in this? Do I still want to connect with those people? Uh, and, and, and if you really examine your, your experiences, you realize you have never left me hanging. You have always been faithful. I know what you want me to do, but still we'll get to a place where like, God, is this, is this really what you want me to do? but we have learned enough to trust and obey. God's record is, is pristine with us. He has always been faithful. I'm going to show a, a video here in, in just a moment, but I'll set it up. Um, and it's, it, it's an old hymn that has traveled with me for almost 30 years now in my life, and, and it might not mean much to you, but I'm going to play it for my own sake. <laughs> okay? If it, if the song is called Trust and Obey, and I would just a invite you to sing along or at least just look at the words. And remember, the, the, psalm, the, the writer of this, John Harris, no, not Harris, his first name is John. Anyway, he wrote hundreds of, of hymns, and almost all of them, all hundreds of hymns that where he set out to take a passage of Scripture and have it interact with his life. Take a passage of Scripture, make it interact with his life, and then he'll write a song out of it. And over 100 uh, hymns, they were all about obeying and trusting, trusting and obeying. And isn't that our lives, where we get the word of God and we make it interact with our lives and we're met with, do I trust him or do I not? I was going to share a couple stories. I'm not too sure if I will, but I was going to share a story of the ropes course where I'm looking at the guy, <laughs> we're looking at the guy, holding me up by just these pulley systems and I have to look at him and go, do I trust you to hold me up? Knowing that you're a part of the, the people who designed this thing and you know what you're doing. Do I trust you? But I decided not to share that story. I was going to share a story about uh, when before I was a Christian and I was brought to the camp that I became a Christian, my, my old youth leader signed me and my friend up, me and Sean up, to sing. We weren't singers at all, but we kept on making fun of this song all camp long uh, called 
right field. It's an old song. We're making fun of it. He signed us up for a, a talent night where everybody was going to give their talent uh, at like the end of the camp. He signed us up, and he told us five minutes beforehand, you're signed up, you're going on in five minutes. We're like, are you kidding me? In front of 280 people, and we had to trust him. We act, it actually, at the end of the, the song, everyone's like, oh, that was so awesome. And we're like, we were just making fun of that song all this week. I decided I'm going to tell you about this trust story instead, more personal or more meaningful. For the longest time, I grew up in a family where love wasn't talked about and religion outside of what we grew up with it would might as well have been a cult. And there came a moment where I had to tell my dad or I've been that, that I'm a pastor or that uh, uh, first it came from telling I'm a Christian, then I had to tell him I'm a pastor, which would just be incredible to, to tell that when I first said that I was a, a Christian, it was like as if I had joined a, a cult, and that was really hard. But I knew God was telling me to trust him and obey him, trust him and obey him. The time that I said that, I didn't receive back the lovey feelings, but I knew Jesus more after that. And then there came a time where I had to be the one to initiate saying, I love you, I love you. And when I got back, wasn't the touchy-feelies, but I knew Jesus so much more after that because it was delivering God's grace. And maybe there's a time or a place in your life right now where God is calling you to say, trust me with this. You're going to be okay. The outcome of what you're going to do for me is going to be okay. Just trust and obey. Let's go ahead and finish with that song.
can trust him because he loves you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We love you because of what you have done, Jesus. We know that we could trust you. Help us, Lord, when we doubt. Help us with our fear. We rely on you completely. We're dependent on you. We know that you know what we're afraid of and where we shy away. But we trust in your grace and we depend on your grace. Thank you, Lord, for this place that we can meet in. Thank you for this family that you have given us that you use to encourage us. We're united in your love, Lord. Make yourself known to us, we pray. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go in God's grace and peace. Thank you for coming, everybody. If you want to get baptized, next week it's still on.